Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Sarnecki, and I am co-founder of Digital Asset. At DA, we are delivering the application platform of choice for institutions building on the emerging world of open financial networks. Regardless of your feelings about the legitimacy of this space, your skepticism as to the true value of the assets being created in it, or your likely distaste for the associated colorful cast of characters, there are large-scale legitimate businesses being built in these new ecosystems. If you look past the hype of the underlying ledgers and their tokens, you'll see an emerging set of challengers providing real value to those looking to participate in these new ecosystems. So with me today, we have an accomplished panel of entrepreneurs who are shaping that future, each run or are building services and businesses that are pushing the boundaries of assets and transactional models. You might be able to look past the early versions of these networks and assets, but you shouldn't sleep on the challengers emerging from it. So, Nathan, would you be so kind as to kick us off letting us know a little bit more about yourself and Anchorage? Sure, thanks, Eric. I'm uh, Nathan McCauley, co-founder and CEO of Anchorage. Uh, Anchorage is a crypto platform that uh, allows people to hold assets with us and build businesses uh, on top of uh, crypto infrastructure. Uh, so we act as an infrastructural layer uh, to enable people to build businesses uh, in crypto. Uh, notably, we, uh, we hold assets, we have a lending desk, we have a trading desk, and we do all of that. Uh, and it's all within a uh, federally regulated OCC bank. Uh, so we were able to uh, act as a fully as a, a qualified custodian, um, and any of the banking you needs you need around crypto assets, uh, we can supply and provide those services. Very cool, Jill. Would you introduce us, please, to Jewel and yourself? Uh, you're muted. I'm Jill Richman. I'm the co-founder and chief revenue officer for Jewel. Uh, Jewel is um, a soon-to-be fully licensed uh, Bermudian digital asset bank. Uh, we provide qualified custody, transactional banking, uh, real-time settlement for internal customers, and lending uh, through crypto collater collateralized lending. And we are um, we will be live and expect to be live roughly around October, November of this year. Great. Now, Jonathan, you've straddled kind of both sides. You've been both at an incumbent and recently made an announcement about launching your own company. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing now and maybe some of your history in the incumbent space? Of course. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Jonathan Padilla, formerly as of about 10 days ago, I was the head of blockchain strategy at PayPal. But as of Friday, publicly announced that I am the CEO and co-founder of Sacred Data Labs, which is building the next generation data layer, leveraging blockchain to really empower consumers to control and own their data, while allowing uh, individuals the ability to, to leverage that data to target individuals and, and really kind of redefine how data is viewed in a Web3 format. That's going to be interesting later, I assure. So, Anatoly, to finish us off here, how does Nickel Digital help investors participate in this ecosystem? Hi, I'm Anatoly. I'm co-founder and CEO of Nickel Digital Asset Management. Uh, we are UK largest uh, crypto dedicated hedge fund. Uh, we run a number of strategies in this space, offering various access points to the market, starting with market neutral arbitrage and going through directional strategies, with idea being offer, creating this bridge between institutional finance and uh, crypto world. Yeah, we've been in business for over two years now. Uh, I personally came from uh, traditional finance uh, before Nickel for seven years was, was with uh, JP Morgan and Goldman's. And in around 2017, the whole crypto story unfolded around me as many Goldman clients were coming back to the firm with the question, are we missing something? Do we have to be exposed to crypto? And GF, very constructive view, saying it may evolve in the new asset class. If you have tolerance to volatility, uh, take a long-term view. If you can trade uh, and kind of uh, exploit this volatility, that's a beautiful asset class to be in, which ultimately led me living a uh, traditional banking system and building a firm which would kind of create this bridge to, to the world. Two years ago, it was unclear whether institutional investors would show you on doorstep, uh, but today we are in conversations uh, with multiple uh, asset allocators, uh, insurance companies, wealth managers, 
whilst initial funding uh, over the last two years was coming primarily from family offices, which are much faster to move and take a view on this market. Great. So that's that's a good segue into my first question of the, of the afternoon here, which is to know a little bit more about your customers. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, I think people get, uh, they overly fixate on the underlying protocols and tokens that are there. But these are very legitimate businesses that you've either previously participated in or about to launch or currently deep into the life cycle of your organization. So you started to speak to us a little bit, Anatoly, about your customers. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's resonating with them, what's catching their eye, and what are they, what are they really participating in from their perspective? Yes, so our uh, very first flagship fund, uh, is, because it's market neutral arbitrage, it does not require people to take a view on crypto market per se, right? Because this fund is really exploiting inefficiencies and price swings in crypto. And that would, cl uh, would click with many of our initial clients who were willing to uh, kind of enter this market without full exposure to the underlying wall. Now, with this fund being in operation for two years now and delivering every single positive month, experience generally has been extremely positive. And that drove people to take directional exposure to crypto, right? And I think what happened last year with the whole COVID story unfolding, it created a very strong reason for people to look at crypto as a store of value because of the scarcity element in built in Bitcoin, uh, first of all, right? And that drove demand for this asset. And when we look uh, to our uh, typical client, they look at crypto as part of their uh, venture capital allocation, because ultimately this is a bet on the technology, right? It has the right to be volatile, but upside potential is huge. And uh, as long as it properly sized, being a few percentage point of their larger portfolio, it fits perfectly fine in the larger portfolio construction. In terms of uh, clients, as I mentioned, family offices are natural first movers. Today, we're seeing a number of uh, fund of funds entering the space and allocating to people like us. Uh, but ultimately, of course, the larger tickets are coming from uh, people like Morgan Stanley and these guys who are now kind of on behalf of their clients, experiencing pressure from their clients are entering this space. And that's very natural evolution of this market. That, that's interesting. Like, how, how does that compare to your customer base, Nathan? Is it, is it nearly identical in terms of the types of institutions that are coming to you, or do you have more of a superset, and how is it different? Sure. I think there's a, there's a lot of overlap there. I'd say there's certainly the inflation hedge, um, even the... Um, the, the notion of it being an optimistic inflation hedge in that it's a, it's an inflation hedge that uh, depends on a, a whole ecosystem building things and uh, building things in a, in a really optimistic and, and positive way. Um, that's certainly one one subsegment of our of our client base. Uh, we also service a number of the crypto hedge funds uh, themselves, particularly crypto VC funds, those like um, Paradigm, uh, Andrews and Horowitz Crypto, uh, anyone who's uh, kind of taking a, a long position and holding a significant amount of assets uh, tend to hold with us. We also tend to uh, serve the protocols themselves. Uh, the protocols themselves uh, end up with a, a pretty large treasury of both their token uh, and funds that they've raised. Uh, and so we end up supporting those use cases as well. We help with everything from uh, distribution of their token at the Genesis event all the way to um, uh, buying and selling of their of their asset and and allowing them to do that, um, and then increasingly we're seeing fintechs and banks uh, come in and want to build on top of the infrastructure that uh, the Anchorage has supplied. So looking at everyone from your bulge bracket banks uh, all the way to more more regional ones, uh, there's a bunch of different strategies that they're they're running, uh, whether it's um, allowing their clients to buy, sell, and hold crypto within the confines of their bank. Uh, two, just saying, hey, they're going to take some of their balance sheet and deploy it into crypto lending programs uh, where you do over collateralized lending. Uh, we support all those use cases uh, for banks. Um, so a healthy mix of fundamentally long investors, uh, protocols themselves, uh, and increasingly banks and neobanks uh, that are looking to build a crypto business on top of the Anchorage infrastructure. And, and do you find that your customers are more specific about what they choose to hold, or are they similarly drawn to 
really the expanding TAM of the market, the volatility of the market, the yields of the market? Or do they come with more of a specific uh, uh, you know, asset type or behavior type that they're looking for? Yeah, it's uh, it's a real it's a real mix of a mix of clients. There are there are plenty of clients that are taking a uh, fundamentally long position on a token or several tokens or the whole market. Uh, there are others, uh, say like Visa. Visa is one of our clients, uh, and Visa is using us for USD settle USDC settlement. Uh, so within within Visa's ecosystem, uh, you can settle USDC transactions. Uh, entirely using Visa Rails, never having to use the um, the fiat infrastructure of the world. Um, so there's a there's a bunch of different use cases. It, it doesn't necessarily just have to be kind of long investor uh, wanting to come in. Uh, there's there's opportunity to use the infrastructure for a number of different um, strategies, and it really just depends on the uh, the client type uh, and the strategy of the uh, the client partner that we're working with. Okay. Now, Jill, you guys are preparing to have a much bigger offering in the market. Could you explain what you're what you're going for, who you're targeting, what's your target customer type, and what types of value you're you're hoping to bring to them through your offering? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, interestingly enough, one thing that we we do like to say we work closely and will be working closely with Anchorage in terms of our um, as a as our. Uh, primary custodian as we launch, and then beyond that, our collateralized lending program. So quite a quite a large subset of uh, existing customer base that we will be, you know, essentially servicing. And beyond that, I would um, I would say so to the extent that we've signed uh, letters of intent right now with some of the largest tier one, tier two exchanges, prop trading firms, um, uh, some OTC desks and beyond, you know, we're expecting to launch with a very similar subset that Nathan pointed to um, appropriately because there's a great deal of overlap. And then from um, from our perspective, you know, we certainly think and we see that we're going to see an inordinate amount of uptick in terms of our collateralized lending program. I, that's what we're forecasting. It's certainly something that we're we're excited to to launch. And on um, almost the opposite end of the spectrum here, Jonathan, can you comment a little bit to while you were at PayPal, how that target customer may have been different from more of the institutional types that were just described, and then also going forward with your new venture, who you're looking to service as well? It's a great question. I mean, PayPal is building for mass adoption. There's phenomenal leadership team in place with Jose Fernandez de Ponte and direct support from the top levels of PayPal from our CEO, Dan Schulman. But PayPal really is focusing on small consumers who are purchasing, you know, hundred dollars, two hundred dollars worth of crypto. Very, very different from the clients that that Joe or Anatoly are working on. I know Nathan's infrastructure at Anchorage is really primed to help empower a lot of the stuff, and I have a lot of respect for everything he's been doing in the space. I think uh, there's a lot of a lot of forward momentum there. But but PayPal's vision is enabling utilization for crypto and buy sell hold of, of crypto is something that I think. My former team is immensely proud of getting to market and is allowing people now to spend Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, and Litecoin. That's offering real-world utility at all the places that PayPal is accepted in, in domestically here in the United States. And with the announcement that we're going to do buy, uh, withdrawal and deposit of crypto later this year, the control of keys will finally kind of move to individuals. So, so PayPal, from that, that vantage point, is very well-primed to help small consumers you want a safe, easy way to access this. And I think that's a, a gateway to other services and, and assets. Uh, on, on our side, on the cyclical side, we're very much focused on initially a B2B play. This is working with other, other creators in the NFT space, other marketplaces, and other exchanges to make sure that our technology is integrated. Eventually, we'll move to a consumer-focusing app on our ID products, but that's probably at least a year out. So we're looking at, at a business play to help business best understand how to leverage this technology and this data to target all the consumers and all the things that are happening now in Web3. And I think as Anatoly mentioned earlier about this bed of digital wallets and, and digital currencies, if you believe in a world where digital wallets are ubiquitous, where digital currencies are ubiquitous, the infrastructure we're, we're building right now at Snickerdoodle will power that uh, going forward. So maybe just to keep going with that, what what would you say, which innovations in this world get you the most excited? And you could maybe talk your book a little bit and say, well, it's the one I'm working on. But I, I'm interested in maybe what outside of your purview, uh, Jonathan, that you think is really innovative and really interesting. 
That's a great question. I mean, to briefly mention some of the stuff we're working on, it's it's basically leveraging technology set to make Web3 you know, truly democratized. And that's something that's become super cliche over the course of the last several years. But I think we're at this kind of tipping point where the technology will be ubiquitous and a lot of these things are being commoditized to the point where people can truly begin to participate with the innovations in Layer 2s and with a lot of great chains like Solana and Polkadot, Adara coming down the pathway, you have technology that will make microtransactions and blockchain available and economical for even the smallest amounts of transactions. What I think more broadly speaking is really interesting, you know, blockchain by itself is a very valuable technology suite, but when you look at other emerging techs like EOT, uh, IoT and frankly machine learning, those have a complete system. The blockchain becomes for the heart, the system that kind of powers the entire thing. AI is the brain and IoT is the nervous system that kind of has sensory input. Those three things combined, that's what's really, really exciting. And you have much more creative benefits than any of those things individually by themselves. And, and Anatoly, what about from the investor perspective? What, what innovative new digital assets do you think your customer base is going to be excited to participate in? Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, all of our clients typically start with this market neutral exposure, uh, but uh, they cannot help themselves but getting more and more excited about DeFi space. And that's for a good reason, because to me, it's a kind of inevitable, highly competitive environment for capital efficiency. And ultimately, coming from traditional finance, I'm on the opinion that ultimately everything going to be going to kind of be this algorithmic form, right? And DeFi is algorithmic form of financial services. What is commercial bank? Essentially kind of it's borrowing on one lend in a site in form of deposits and lending on the other hand, you can create, and, and, and in the middle in commercial banks, you have a bunch of bricks and stuff which is handling these operations. You can put this in algorithmic form. And uh, we saw this pattern in a traditional trading environment. Uh, and on, on the European trading desk uh, for the bank I used to work for, by the time I arrived, there was like 30 people trading on the desk. By the time I left, there were two people remaining on that desk because everything went into algorithmic form. So absolutely the same stuff going to happen with traditional banking systems, uh, services. And I think it's um, uh, all these insurance uh, services, borrowing and lending, uh, exchange ultimately, they got stuck somehow in the last century and that where disruption is required. And I think DeFi exactly brings that. So uh, we are seeing this as the most important area of, of growth for the foreseeable future. Even Bitcoin, uh, whilst it has created this industry, I think ultimately it will pale uh, in comparison to the growth coming from DeFi space. If you look, uh, Bitcoin uh, roughly has a market cap of one trillion, slightly lower today, but say one trillion. If you buy into thesis that Bitcoin is digital gold, then your proxy is traditional gold, which has market cap of 10 trillion. So basically the growth factor is roughly 10x from what Bitcoin is today to where it can evolve by matching gold. Now, if you look on uh, DeFi space, the total capital lock today is roughly $60 billion, of which lending protocols is 20, 25 billion. And then you look, what is a comparable number, sort of addressable market in a traditional uh, banking system? So you have uh, borrowing, uh, kind of uh, bank lending, banking mortgages, and various bond market. This cumulatively is $140 trillion. So from where we are today, 20 billion, to $140 trillion, there is quite a way, right? Uh, would I say that DeFi will substitute financial services? Perhaps it's a stretch, but can it address 10% of the market? Oh, hell yes. Can it be done in the next five to 10 years? Of course. And then if you link these two numbers, where DeFi is today, and only 10% of a traditional banking uh, services, this is the growth factor of 700X. And I think that's exactly the growth you may want to capture. And that's what excites our clients. 
And that was the reason we launched our fourth fund, which is not typical kind of your hedge fund, but really kind of a long bet on these markets, uh, on DeFi space. In our case, it's very heavily research driven. It's not really kind of top 10 coins. Uh, we're going deeper in this space to select 37 positions, which we have today in the portfolio. It's being rebalanced. It's adjusted on a weekly basis. But ultimately, your goal is to capture structural expansion of this, uh, of this space. And I think that's where the opportunity is. I think those are all great points. And I'm curious, Nathan, do you see activity across the breadth of your platform that's kind of leaning towards the direction of the the excitement going more towards these more rich protocols and away from the simple token holding? Or what are you seeing on your side? We absolutely do. We absolutely see the the same kind of trends that uh, Anatoly is talking about. Um, particularly if you look at, look at DeFi, um, DeFi is uh, a lot of things all at once. It is a... Uh, uh, revolution in the way that we think about financial services. Uh, it also ends up being a revolution in the way that we think about governance. Uh, if you look at like, if you look at something like Bitcoin, um, deciding what happens in Bitcoin right now is is a, uh, a an elegant dance between uh, the Bitcoin core developers and the the miners, uh, and it it works. It works, and it's it's designed to be pretty stable. Uh, so it doesn't change much, but the, the DeFi protocols themselves need to change. They need to evolve. Uh, and so what you're seeing with many of them is a, a focus on governance and uh, being able to have the the holders of tokens uh, get a stake and get to get to vote in what happens uh, moving forward. Uh, and so we see many of our clients wanting to vote in those protocols, uh, wanting to actively use their assets, uh, to say express an opinion on what's going to happen to say uh, – Compound or Ave or uh, any of the other um, huge number of uh, DeFi protocols that are out there, uh, and to me, I think that that general trend is what excites me maybe the most about the whole uh, blockchain ecosystem. Uh, right now, everything is. I mean, a lot of what we're seeing is financial services or things that are ancillary to financial services, uh, but it is. As much as it is a financial innovation, as much as it is a technology innovation, as much as it is a security innovation, I think it is also a sociological innovation. Uh, so the fact that we have autonomous networks uh, that are able to operate independently, Bitcoin for store of value, uh, DeFi for decentralized lending and decentralized financial services, uh, we're going to see this uh, take over many other areas of the, of the economy. And so I, I believe that we will see decentralized social networks. I, I believe we'll see decentralized news organizations. I believe we'll see uh, decentralization of nearly every global uh, global protocol. And there's going to be come a point pretty soon where entrepreneurs uh, like us here, uh, like the new set of entrepreneurs that come in, will inherently want to build decentralized protocols to start because that will be the primary way that you're able to have a global platform. And the, the easiest way to have a global platform right now is to deploy on top of some of these decentralized networks. And so that is a trend. Uh, it, it might be that in the in the long stream of things, we look at all the financial service innovation that happened, and realize that that was a footnote to the uh, broader story of uh, decentralization of technology. Well put. So maybe changing gears a little bit. I, there's an excellent panel either earlier today or later today about regulation. But I, in particular, I'm curious about what regu what sorts of regulations, I mean, I know we all have to be kind of careful about how we say this, but what sorts of regulations do we think would clarify and make it easier for you to provide your services? Maybe I'll, I'll start with Jill. I know you're in a, in a situation that maybe you can't comment too directly on some of this, but I'm still interested to know what types of direction from regulations <laughs> would make your life a lot easier? Well, I mean, I think what I can say, and I, probably very self-serving. I mean, we we deliberately sought Bermuda as a jurisdiction because of the regulatory clarity uh, as a single regulator. Um, so, uh, you know, without looking and forecasting what I think is effective, I can tell you that we've chosen and elected to be in Bermuda. We will be, and we expect to be one of the first licensed banks in, in almost 40 years. Uh, and we've been working really, really closely um, with what we think are incredibly innovative uh, minds. And quite frankly, Bermuda in many ways has been punching above its weight in the financial services industry for a really long time. And it's a safe and highly regulated environment. And so to the extent that DABA 
and what is the Digital Asset Business Act, which was um, instituted in 2018, um, created a modified and additional class, which is basically a, um, a lower bar to entry for a lot of entrepreneurs that can operate uh, and test and, and trial out what they're doing here in Bermuda creates an opportunity for us. And so we're, we're thrilled to be here. We're thrilled to be working with our, our regulators and we're thrilled to be working in a place where we know we have a lot of certainty and clarity. Thank you. And Jonathan, being that you're a, one of the more innovative asset class types that we're talking about here, is there, is there something on your wish list? Is there some guidance or jurisdictional uh, direction that would make your life significantly easier? I'll approach this actually from two areas. Like on, on the data side, you know, I think getting clarity on how digital currencies and their issuance so we can avoid this regulatory arbitrage game would be great as somebody who's going to launch a digital currency in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but, but let me actually, I think, dive deeper. I have a deeper perspective of I spent a number of years in government from the White House uh, on the local government in California. Actually, still am co-director of Stanford's Future Digital Currency Initiative. And we do, we're doing a lot of work convening thought leaders from both protocols, custodians, uh, traditional institutions, to try to address these issues. And, and actually, back in 2000, 2018, I was a Schwarzman scholar at Tsinghua, wrote my master's thesis on transnational regulation of digital assets, a lot of field work done at the PBOC in Beijing. So this is something that was actually my kind of gateway into, into crypto. And I think from, from a macro level, a lot of it comes down to education. Uh, I was in Miami this past week, had wonderful conversations, and hearing people talk about the issues in front of us at the core, it's getting people who are making regulatory decisions a base level of understanding of the assets of what they're about to regulate. And I think that's a really, really important step forward. There are a number of really interesting initiatives globally that I think are trying to do this. I want to highlight the work being done by the UK's Financial Conduct Authority. For the past several years, they've launched a fintech sandbox that has been a real shot in the arm in terms of, of knowledge and know-how for the FCA and how to best regulate digital assets. And I think having that kind of mindset of let's learn, let's figure out friction points and then regulate is frankly going to offer better long-term results than trying to go for clarification in the short term, of which I think regulators still need to figure out what's happening. And I think business models are still developing uh, from you know, the anchorages of the world to the PayPal's of the world, which will have large ramifications. So I think education and getting people on the same page, even with definitions, is where we're at. We're, we're still very, very early on in, in, in this. Just a quick story in regulation. When, when the U.S. set up the SEC, uh, the person who was the first SEC commissioner was actually Joe Kennedy, uh, the pres President Kennedy's father. And the reason FDR appointed him to be chair of the SEC was because he was, you know, probably the most nefarious, knew every trick in the book guy in short trading that kind of led to Black uh, Black Thursday in Wall Street in the, in the big crash in late in late uh, in twenty nine. So it's we have to go find somebody who has been testing the limits give them a white hat and, and, and clearly work with that person. I'm not sure who that might be in the industry, but I still think we have a lot to learn before we have such macro level regulations. People in the crypto space need to be more comfortable working with government. Government's not an asthma. And I think if we can find cooperation, uh, there's a real path forward there to get the right regulation in large jurisdictions in place. Okay. I don't want to, I don't want to belabor the, I wanted to add to this uh, to this question. I think, contrary to the popular belief, actually, crypto community is very uh, pro-regulation because what we require is really a regulatory a regulatory clarity, right? And that will reopen or open door to a much larger capital. So, in our case, we have chosen to be regulated from day one. Uh, became first FCA regulated fund here in the UK in uh, crypto arbitrage, but it's a, it's a painful process, right? It takes 18 months, and ultimately, I wish it was much faster than that. Uh, but of course, regulators are learning alongside you, kind of what is crypto, how to regulate this very unusual asset class. But ultimately, the greater is the clarity, the greater capital is willing to access this market. That is specifically important for the larger institutional investors, because 
uh, you can only kind of imagine what is the internal headwinds, how they have to fight between business who are willing to engage and internal compliance who are saying like, wait a minute, look at these, these, these risks or a lack of clarity on these points. So the fast regulation uh, regulators will uh, provide this clarity, the more adoption we're going to see in the sector. So but this is going to cut some of your volatility and yield out of it as well. Though. So I mean, well, it, it may cut some volatility, but the depth of the market will increase exponentially. And uh, for me, these kind of two things, which we are very happy to trade some vol for depth, the greater depth. Understood. Okay, so uh, we know that people are buying these things. I think that that's probably the hardest component to define. What is this? At times, you might only just be investing in the sentimental value of something that's already replicably replicated freely across the internet. So uh, I'll start with maybe Nathan on this. Could you shed some light onto what people see as the value of their investment? What do they see as the underlying utility or, or, or import of what they're participating in? Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's, Many, many different ways to kind of look at the the value of what is being bought when you're buying a, a digital asset. So much of it depends on what the underlying asset is. Uh, a couple of a couple of mental models that people use are uh, you 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 first mentioned um, uh, the sentimental value uh, kind of an aspect of it, which is uh, very very related to everything around NFTs. If you're if you're buying a picture, you're buying. Uh, some sort of a, a representation of the ownership of a song or uh, some other kind of a non-fungible item, uh, then it's fundamentally about scarcity. Uh, so where, how do you, how do you uh, value the scarcity of a particular asset? How, how much do people want to pay for it? How much do they want to do? Uh, and crypto here, I think, is, is pretty unrivaled within all of finance uh, in that price discovery and global 24-7 liquidity uh, is taken as a given. It is taken as as an of course uh, within the within the a broader crypto ecosystem. There's not a there's not a single crypto business that ever closes, um, but there are of course most financial institutions uh, institutions close. Uh, so having ready markets for so many of these different assets is is incredibly important, especially when you look at the um, the digital assets that trade more freely and are are in fact fungible, say Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, even we talked about earlier, Polkadot, all of these have uh, global markets uh, where the assets trade. And the valuation thesis for those tends to look uh, something like what um, Anatoly was talking about earlier, which is what is the usage of the network? What is the, the native coin that is native to the, the network in question? Uh, and how big of a network effect does that particular uh, set of use cases have? You'll get like something like Ethereum. You have uh, Ethereum as a as a store of value, uh, but then you have all of the other apps that are being built on top of Ethereum. So how do you how do you measure the value of that? Do you measure the value of it like it's uh, currency? Do you measure it like it's a network? Uh, do you measure it like it's AWS? Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a ton of different uh, mental models that you can start to look at. Uh, and you really have to develop a, uh, a thesis more broadly on what is going to happen with the whole crypto ecosystem. Uh, and for uh, people like us on the panel that I would, I would characterize broadly as uh, hopeless bulls. Uh, we are going to be bulls for the, the rest of our lives in this space. Um, we believe things that are currently uh, hard to characterize to anybody else uh, because we believe that uh, this really is going to be the future of so many of the way things operate. Uh, and so it once people start looking at it, they, I think they all develop different theories of how the assets will be valued. Uh, but generally speaking, it's around scarcity of the asset and the size of the network growth uh, that is uh, available within the within the network. I think I, very clear proposition to that, right? Because if you look at what happened in the US, for example, over the last 12 months, M2 money supply has expanded 28%. And of course, if you think every single dollar uh, from all dollars in circulation over 20% have been created over the last 12 months. And of course, that triggers a very logical concerns about currency debasement, which unfold is, is unfolding before our eyes. And that's where the value of uh, scarcity comes at play. And uh, the value proposition of Bitcoin to me is exactly inflationary hedge. 
and uh, this hedge against uh, monetary debasement. So uh, how would you value that? Well, there is no cash flow attached to uh, Bitcoin. Well, at least kind of on a broader sense, right? From that perspective, supply and demand, that's how uh, the value of this item is being uh, established. And given that supply side is completely inelastic, there are 6.25 coins being released per block, whatever is the demand. Demand can go 10x tomorrow, system would still release 6.25 Bitcoin. And uh, there is no correlation with computing power, uh, size of demand and so on, which means on the supply side, you have inelastic supply. On demand side, it's a growing demand. And the only balancing factor between two happen to be price. Hence, we've seen this price rise uh, since March last year. And then, of course, uh, the network effect comes to play. Um, and Kafka's law essentially states that the number of users to the power of two, that's how you value the network. And certainly we are seeing greater and greater adoption. Uh, forget about uh, short-term price swings and uh, price correction, which we saw in May. There are some technical reasons for that. Structurally, long-term, there is an adoption and that drives the price up. And I think the model is pretty kind of clear the way it uh, crystallizes as a price action. Okay. And Jonathan, given that you're launching an NFT platform here in the future, how do you pitch to people the value of an NFT? Or are you pitching instead more the underlying value of the network that's been described here before? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I would say the following. First, the value of how we're structuring our token is, is very much utility-based. We want to assign a data lake and warehouse that we think will grow exponentially over time with Web3 and assign our token to, to kind of be a claim on that value. So we see it as really a true utility token where people can use these doodles, our cryptocurrency, to basically value, uh, to, to do impressions and campaigns with consumers across Web3. So we, we see real value creation there. But I, I would say this, I mean, when it comes to the NFT market, we've seen some phenomenal pieces with people and others who are getting crazy values with people at Sotheby's and Christie's. I don't think that's actually the most valuable component of NFTs. People are thinking about NFTs very short-sightedly. And one of the reasons I'm starting Snickerdoodle is simply because I have a, to, to borrow Nathan's term, a 10, 20 year outlook on NFTs where industrial and commercial grade applications of this technology will be completely transformative for the entire industry, for really all, all consumers across a myriad of applications. Imagine a world where basically everything from transit tickets to coupons to receipts are all forms of NFT, allowing for next level integrations and applications from everything from data tracking to rewards to incentive models. Big fan of, of Case Sustin and the work on Nudge and the concept of libertarian paternalism. I think we can incentivize people in a way that is respectful of their wishes and their sovereignty. And Secret really is a platform to allow for that. So that's that's a trillion dollar plus market. That's more than a fleeting uh, amount of digital collectibles from a baseball or basketball. I'm really going after long term industrial applications and. That's something people have just begun to really understand, and uh, it's something I think will be transformative. So can I ask my uh, favorite controversial question of the panel here? We've spent the better part of the last 35 or so minutes discussing the power of decentralization, the power of decentralized markets, the power of open innovation, and yet I see, no offense intended, for centralized lift and shift businesses providing access to these marketplaces. Can I maybe start with Anatoly? Do you see any threat to decentralized hedge funds, on-chain hedge funds attacking your business model? And how do you justify running what is a very traditional looking business as an access point to a brand new type of marketplace? Well, uh, our business today, the way it's structured, it's uh, focused on the centralized exchanges. The reason being, that's where the liquidity is. And for us, to trade, and we're trading in billions uh, on an annual basis, you need liquidity pool, you need depth of the market. 
However, uh, we are extremely sharper focused on uh, DeFi space. And uh, even today, already you have uh, Uniswap with the volumes uh, on given days matching Coinbase. And uh, that's for us is the next frontier. So today we are arbing between centralized exchanges and DeFi. Ultimately, I think three years from now, five years from now, most of our trading can go through decentralized exchanges. So I'm extremely optimistic that uh, that's the way the industry will develop. Will I would threaten by emergence of those uh, decentralized hedge funds? I think no, I think we're gonna be one of those, right? Which are gonna be uh, spearheading this development and uh, going into DeFi space. And it's a uh, ripe with opportunities just because uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a new space. Uh, not only it's going for the early uh, stage of adoption and uh, there are kind of inefficiencies still there. Uh, overall, I think uh, it opens completely new gateway, right? And for many traditional players, it's a very new world. So we are in a better position to take advantage of that. And hopefully actually by being present there as arbitrageurs, we are making this market more efficient. That's part of our game in the centralized exchanges. But as I'm saying, decentralized, that's the way forward, we go gonna evolve naturally. So here you are, you're saying, there is a chance that one day Nickel Digital is a decentralized autonomous organization on some chain or chains that you're taking that will be directing capital and providing financial strategies to a broader set of accredited investors. That's generally, you're, you're open to the concept. Absolutely, yes. Uh, so kind of I think first step is trading on those decentralized venues and ultimately considering full decentralization. Why not? Okay. It's kind of, All right. That's what I'm just hearing. I'll come back in a few years and see how that's going. <laughs> uh, what, what about you, Nathan? Similar, similar question. Yeah, I would say um, the way the way that I think about kind of banking infrastructure and, uh, and crypto infrastructure and the, the way that we function is uh, I guess reasoning by analogy, if you look at something like the founding of the United States, um, the the founding fathers of the United States looked at it and said, "Hey, we need a bank." And so Ale Alexander Hamilton, for example, started Bank of New York, not because he wanted there to be a bank. Uh, the bank was there to support the American experiment. Uh, and when I when I look at Anchorage, Anchorage is here to support the crypto experiment broadly. Uh, and so the, the whole purpose of uh, us existing as a, as a banking institution, uh, as an infrastructure provider, is to enable everything within this space. Uh, and so I don't, uh, by no means are protocols themselves competitive to us. It is like our, our reason for existing is to enable protocols and to enable usage of those protocols. Uh, and uh, I, I look at, well, if you, if you go to the Bitcoin Talk forums, uh, very specifically, very, very early on, Satoshi and Hal Finney were talking about there being Bitcoin banks one day. Uh, and the idea that there would be banks that would support Bitcoin based use cases uh, was a, a very early, a very early notion uh, from the very beginning of, of, of Bitcoin's history. Uh, and so uh, I, I view us as a, a natural evolution of what had to happen here. Uh, this, uh, in order for uh, people to get mainstream access to these services, uh, they're going to want easy ways to do that. Infrastructure is going to be needed, and we are we are here to support the whole movement. Um, and so, it's it's our our entire reason for existing is to push everything forward and to um, satisfy the goals of the of the community. Uh, make make no mistake about it. I am in no way questioning the services that you provide to the markets. It is more the methods by which you have decided to deliver them today. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think people have in their mind this concept that when, if everyone held their own assets directly, all these intermediaries would disappear. They wouldn't. They would just become delegated services. It would just be a different mode of engagement. Absolutely. So then, so then Jonathan, you raised money traditionally, I'll say. I know that you're still probably in the early works of trying to figure out how you'll do it. So maybe you're straddling the line a little bit here, a little bit of a mix of new and old business models going forward. But could I ask you about maybe PayPal and your experience there, how they thought about 
providing this big centralized behemoth access point into a decentralized network. Did they ever openly have a conversation about the irony in that? I mean, I don't think there's irony at all. I think it's in a, we're in a transitory period and crypto is this kind of great experiment that's maturing. And as maturation happens, there has to be pathways for people to feel comfortable to get into this type of, of, of market. I mean, PayPal is allowing people to have their grandmothers buy and sell Bitcoin. And that's, that, that's a big, bold statement. It's one thing to have people on this call go and use a liquidity pool. It's another thing to have somebody who might be 70 or 80 years old participate in this market. And I, and I think the power of that and the vision of Dan Schulman and the leadership team at PayPal is that we really want to democratize financial access to a broad range of individuals. In order to accelerate that, you have to have compromises along the way. So different from the prior conversation on government. You know, how do you, to Anatoly's point earlier, you trade regulation and some of the Wild West so you have larger, deeper pools with a broader consumer base. And I think PayPal is frankly the most important name in the space when it comes to advancing that cause and being a standard bearer for the entire business. Yeah. When PayPal came with uh, this breakthrough announcement back in October 22nd, yeah. I believe, right? I called it PayPal moment because actually the impact on the industry on adoption should not be underestimated. So and, and, th and there's great people there. I mean, people like Jose Fernandez, the Ponte, Paul Bances, Mike Dasco, you had some just wonderfully bright visionaries at PayPal and to my former colleagues still there at PayPal, just can't emphasize enough these are some of the smartest people in this space. They're white hats and they believe in a, in a crypto future. They're trying to help streamline that and, and advance it as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So if I were to open this up a little bit more and ask, uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Jill. Do you feel like there's anything really um, missing in this ecosystem, whether it's a feature, it's a service, it's a particular participant, do you feel like there's a, a real key missing component to hit the types of mass adoption and scale that has been discussed so far in the panel? I mean, I would get hyper-specific as it relates to what Jewel is doing. And I know that we are very much looking to get um, some standardization around stable coins. And I think that's a really important uh, component to our, certainly to our business model as a direct issuer of stable coins. Um, and I think it's one, one, I think, key component, at least to uh, the way that we are operating in our infrastructure. And I think that is something that, um, you know, if I could, if I could, if I could be, you know, honest about it, it's, it's an area that we still feel that there's not a lot of homogeneity or standardization around. And so. And let's say that you're completely successful in that dream. How, how is that going to change uh, the behavior of these ecosystems? Like, how, how do you see that playing out as it, as it advances? Well, I think right now what we're looking at is still, it, it's, it, for us, we are, you know, we intend to be a direct bank issuer of stable coins one-to-one, -one, audited, created, a great deal of clarity. And I think it still is, you know, how, how, what are the, what are the vehicles that are going to bring more institutional comfort into this space? And so to the extent that I think it starts to create homogeneity and clarity across the board around how they're treated, it makes a huge difference in terms of how, you know, institutions continue to operate in, uh, in the banking space and beyond around payments. So. And, and how, how far should we take this? Like, um, I, people ask me all the time, like, well, how many coins can there really be? But same type of question around stable coins. Can you imagine a stable coin per person at some point in the future? Like, what, what do you think is kind of the right stasis of supply that it is the right balance between like innovation and access and the types of things that it's servicing versus noise and confusion? Do you have a sense of what that is? No, I don't. I, I, I really don't. And I and I want to be clear that I don't know that I can be, you know, that I can boldly say that I have, a, you know, a statement about that. But I but I, I just want to be really clear that for me, it's it's really and for us. I think it's a matter of, you know, who's left holding the bag when there is a redemption event. And so and, and so that is that is really the most important piece. Thank you. Uh, 
and say, who's going to have a fun opinion on that? Nathan? Oh, I mean, I'll say just a little bit on, on, on stable coins. I don't think we have, um, I don't think we have a, a stable coin yet that, that is uh, uh, an attempt at the like theoretical idea of a stablecoin. Like I, I, the theoretical st- idea of a stablecoin right now, it's all pegging back to a, a notion of a, a fiat currency. Uh, so we we view something as stable if it's stable relative to one dollar. Uh, but as we all know, uh, the the supply of dollars increased dramatically over the last year. Uh, so the notion that a, a, a a stablecoin must be something that pegs back to fiat currency. So I think something that we'll see um, uh, some different ideas around that o- over the next several years. And, and if there is if there is to be a stablecoin at some point that uh, is stable against a basket of goods, uh, that could be just a, a fundamental innovation in the notion of a stablecoin. Uh, so that's that's one area where I think there's still plenty of room for innovation. I think there's plenty of room for innovation on uh, centralized and decentralized stablecoins. Um, and then likely uh, infinite white space right now uh, for other uh, other different uh, things to be built. Uh, so when we say what is what is missing, well, uh, if if we fast forward 10 years out, uh, almost everything that we're talking about 10 years from now doesn't exist uh, right now. Uh, so it's almost as if there is there is infinite things that are missing right now because there's uh, there's so much opportunity in, in the whole space. Uh, so if you look at uh, new ideas for stable coins, new ideas for um, uh, technology built, um, better integration so that we have truly decentralized apps uh, where you see uh, decentralized compute plus decentralized storage plus decentralized naming all coming together and building building interfaces there. Um, there's a there's a huge amount of uh, of opportunity uh, that we could be that could we be, we could be building. Um, honestly, every every entrepreneur that is thinking about building a service right now uh, should be looking at crypto and seeing like what is the what are the use cases what are what are things that can be built there because the um, the the creative uh, blank canvas that is available right now is is pretty unprecedented and pretty exciting. And a lot of pent up demand, right? I think that that's what continues to impress me about the space is that it has self selected to be a group of people that are really interested to participate and support the other projects in the space. Now, granted, often incentives are aligned to make that a little bit easier for most, but I do find that you, you have a group of people willing to experiment with money, which is maybe one of the first real times that we. You've seen a huge group of collective people willing to take large losses, well, paper losses on day today, uh, to support their favorite projects and be involved. Um, so, same question about what's missing, Jonathan. Any any thoughts about? I mean, you're you're going to start building some of these services in this ecosystem. Is there something in particular that you feel like you're reaching for as you're thinking about your new company? Yeah, I mean. Everything we're building on data is really one, something that's designed to empower individuals. And to kind of answer the question, Eric, you asked a little bit earlier about decentralization versus centraliza- uh, decentralization. I mean, we're really designed is to basically empower individuals to take control of the data. Web2 had the, the rise of Facebook and Google, phenomenal companies with great leaders who've done amazing things. But in those areas, they're very centralized, data is controlled by these entities. Snickerdoodle's vision is really to reimagine the internet. How do we create a system where people control their data, license it back to an entity and are, and are compensated for that in a way uh, very rem- uh, reminiscent to what Andrew Yang talked about with the food and I mean, Snickerdoodle's vision is if we do this properly, people will be compensated for their data, not just domestically in the US, but globally. And that creates a form of, of private sector UBI that could be transformative to people in developing economies. In the long term is digital ID is, is what's happening here, which is one of those things that if could be enacted would be transformed for the whole industry. It's one of those critical pieces of infrastructure, apart from what Nathan's building with custodianship, that would be truly transformative and allow frictionless interactions between both the digital and physical worlds. And you know, I'm a firm believer that non-fungible tokens are the right way to do this. A lot of people have approached digital ID for more traditional means. If you can have a dynamic digital ID that's composable with NFTs, that's something that could, you know, if you're at uh, one of the Bitcoin parties in Miami trying to get into a club, 
to opening a bank account to going through passport control, it can mold to fit the needs of the instance and of the circumstance. And that's the type of technology and infrastructure that will power not just growth in developed economies, but frankly, the elite frog for those from developing economies who frankly need this technology even more so than, than folks here in the U.S. or Europe. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and just for completeness, because I'm, I'm searching for an answer here and I haven't heard it yet. So Anatoly, any, any thoughts on what's missing from, to make this huge ecosystem really happen or any obvious missing steps along the way? Yes, so there is one elephant in the room K, called KYC IML, right? And uh, whatever the thesis of or ethos of uh, crypto community is, it has to be anonymous. There are no one, no government should have interference or transparency on individual transactions. In reality, of course, even Bitcoin is not anonymous, right? At best, it's pseudonymous. Uh, but fundamentally, to unlock this industry for large institutional uh, players, we have to address the issue of uh, AML KYC. And I have to admit for the larger players uh, who are coming, that's not a problem. They're not trying to hide their identity or uh, make it semi-transparent. In our case, being uh, fully uh, regulated, whenever we are onboarding with a given exchange and we're trading at 17 exchanges, you go through a proper KYC every single time. Now, what this uh, system is missing is a service whereby I would have a full onboarding with a company which provides these KYC IML services. And whenever I need to verify my identity, say by onboarding with a new exchange, this exchange can independently verify my status and my KYC credentials using zero knowledge proof protocol and obtaining the information which is required from a centralized, if you will, entity. But that would eliminate this unnecessary multiple onboarding and the pain with every single kind of move. More importantly, it would allow large institutional investors to enter the space because around them, they would have a cleared parties, right? And counterparty is important for every single uh, regulated entity. So you may still have a dual system whereby up to certain amount, however small, $3,000, $10,000, you may survive without the proper clearance. Above that, it has to be verified, right? And it can be uh, made by far more efficient than it is today. And even you can see this first attempt by Aave, for example, creating this permission pool, uh, which is now kind of institutional pool, if you will. And people who are part of that pool, they are pre-cleared. And this perhaps a natural evolution because you cannot stay in the, in the shadow for extended period of time. Larger capital would require different framework. So this KYC IML has to, be, has to become an integral part, uh, but it has to be smooth rather than uh, this painful paperwork, which we are unfortunately still facing in this industry. And Anatoly, just quickly on that, I mean, that's the vision of what we're building at Secretal, is to have that ID be able to automate the KYC and AML. And I think I, we share a very common vision there of trying to have this be ubiquitous and frictionless. And that's going to be, to your point, unlocking that 800-pound elephant in the room. Absolutely. Yeah. We're on the same page. All great answers, but I'm going to channel my inner John McLaughlin and say, wrong. What's missing is privacy. If you want people to interact over all these really critical, it's part of my everyday life, it's my passport, it's my this, it's my that you better be able to guarantee the privacy of that data to the user. All right, so anyway, moving ahead, last one to close it out here, a fun one. So kind of a continuation of the previous. Uh, what's the craziest thing you'd like to see participate in the network? Now, I might have to ask you from a personal perspective how, how you feel about this. The company may not feel comfortable commenting on it, but what's the craziest thing you'd like to see built or occur in the market today? Something that would really make headlines. Who wants to go first? How about I'll, take, I'll take it. Uh, okay. I'm, uh, one of my co-founders and I have had long conversations on space mining, and this is probably fitting in that bucket of crazy. Although, to be frank, we pitched this to John Thornton, former executive chairman of Barrick, and he, he wanted to learn more. So I'll say it maybe with a grain of salt there. But I think tokenization of asteroids as a way to raise capital for space mining, that 
one would be really, really awesome. And two would be something that's probably requisite for long-term growth of our, our macro economy. We're facing finite resources. You know, I'm not going to say we have to colonize Mars in the next 20 years like Elon, mm. but I do think space industry and the, the amounts of capital you know, past the value of the nation state is going to require new mechanisms of capital uh, formation, control, and, and payouts. And I think you know, security tokens and, and other related infrastructure could be really critical to unlock uh, that next evolution of humanity. That's a fun answer. Tokenized asteroids. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> um, how about you, Anatoly? <laughs> well, actually, tokenization and fractionalization of real, uh, real uh, assets is something which I think is a next big frontier. And it's not as crazy. Perhaps asteroids is a bit far, far, far-fetched, although kind of interesting idea. But I think we have plenty of assets to be tokenized in a traditional world before we go into outer space. For example, uh, if you look on the real estate market, it's still not that accessible for uh, uh, kind of wide investment community, right? If you are talking about large, say, residential pieces in New York, right, your entry ticket is two, three million dollars. Below that, you cannot really access this market in a proper manner. Now, if you can tokenize it down to a square meter or square centimeter, you can build a portfolio of uh, real estate assets in uh, Tokyo, New York, and London uh, without really sparing three million in each of these jurisdictions. And that creates completely different access point to a much kind of more democratized manner, right? Uh, Another thing what you can do, you can create completely unique products. For example, you can build a portfolio of uh, residential real estate overlooking central parks. So in New York going to be Central Park, in London it's going to be properties overlooking Hyde Park, in uh, Tokyo going to be properties overlooking Mitsubishi Park, right? And then you have this prime real estate which is pre-selected based on very uh, unusual or very specific uh, properties. So something which is unaccessible in a current uh, structure, but you can do it via this tokenization and fractionalization of assets. And we can come up with a number of possible implementations, but uh, really kind of blockchain allows for that. And that to me, the most exciting kind of avenue, which yet to be uh, kind of brought to the world in the, in, the, in, the, in the years to come. Just what everybody wants to hear. I now have millions of landlords are doing over which part of my apartment I'm stepping on at a given time. Uh, Jill? Yeah, I mean, I topic? would... Yeah, no, and I have to say, you know, Anatoly, I'm going to have to agree with you. That's actually, you know, an area that's of particular interest to me, the accessibility, being able to sort of uh, have a portfolio of several different residential pieces of prime real estate uh, is something that is of particular interest and certainly something that I am on a personal note working on, uh, not outside of Jules <laughs> sphere. So that's that's of particular interest to me. Mm. All right, and the final word on the craziest thing. Uh, I'd say probably the, the craziest thing, and in, in, in keeping it uh, keeping it personally, you know, I think we uh, went through a uh, you know year long uh, year long period of uh, financial uh, retraction, uh, and so there is there is an opportunity right now uh, to do something of something pretty. Uh, magnificent in terms of public works projects, uh, getting people back to work. And so uh, I would say infrastructure projects that would be uh, financed by by crypto, uh, whether it's uh, financing the projects by crypto or uh, literally financing, uh, say, clean energy build out uh, by using uh, mining infrastructure, uh, say, a, a massive solar installation uh, that is able to self monetize with mining before it's hooked up to the grids. Uh, I think we could do some some pretty fantastic things uh, if we were uh, if we were thinking about it in that way. And it's uh, you know we have a we have a once in a century worldwide recession to come out of, uh, and so it's a it's a, a nice opportunity to to do some uh, counterintuitive things. Maybe a, a Hoover Dam 2.0 uh, financed by uh, uh, mining off of uh, a solar a massive solar installation. Uh, you know why not? Uh, we could we could. We can attempt these kinds of things. And so uh, some of that kind of stuff would be pretty interesting to look at. 
Eric, and if I can add here, uh, the expansion of this uh, space, it, it, the space is going for the Camberwell explosion, for sure, with the new project, new ideas. And expansion of this uh, space will be anything but a straight line, right? There are going to be ups and downs. And as any new business, there are going to be 95% of failed projects. And yet, given that we're dealing with exponential assets, if you can capture early winners, they will overcompensate for those projects which did not come to fruition or became irrelevant in this evolutionary process. And to me, the good example is Google. When it when Google first time came to market uh, to raise capital, it was July 1999, and they were raising Series A at the valuation of 75 million. And many people at the time were saying, like, listen, who needs yet another search engine? There is Yahoo, there is Northern Light, uh, Alta Vista, what Google can bring. And by the way, piece of software, 75 million bucks, like uh, it's, it's in, 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 in irrational valuation. And guess what? This single project has grown to be worth $1.6 trillion. So even if you invested in parallel with Google, with all uh, these less successful projects, this single winner has overcompensated because Google alone has grown 21,000 times in valuation, right? Uh, so it's perfectly fine to take risk and invest in a number of projects, knowing that some of them inevitably will be foundation for a new technology, a new economy going forward. You heard it here, for folks. Invest in asteroids. One of them is going to be worth trillions. You never know. So thank you very much to our panel today. I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. And I hope that we will see more of our listeners and viewers participating in our ecosystem soon. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.